you know, I'm a mathematician. I like to say this. You know, sometimes it impresses people, sometimes it disgusts people, but I'm a mathematician. And whether you like it or not, mathematicians love to define things before they discuss them. And so I'd like to define passion before I get on to the job of talking about how passion can be discovered. And you know, when mathematicians define something, then they also illustrate with examples. And when you combine the two, then quite often, in fact very often, clarity emerges. And you begin to get an idea of what we are trying to grope with, what we are trying to discover, what we are trying to talk about. And so, it's best that we come to grips with the meaning of passion. And you know, the common understanding of passion has, I think, two levels, a base level, which in terms of what ancient Indian philosophy calls a tamasic level. If you look at the graph of a person's inner feelings, beliefs, convictions, actions, combine everything into a single graph, then this base passion that I talk about occurs like a jump and subsides again and doesn't lead to anything that ennobles or enables. It's not something that is at a higher, noble, sustained level. On the other hand, there's this other kind of passion. Again, I use a term from ancient Indian philosophy, sattvic passion, the higher passion. And the term passion can actually be translated into something else. And I would like to use the term antar dhwani, the inner drum beat. And you know, drum beats can be very powerful. And if you can have a drum beat that stays with you for a significant part of your life, then it drives you and you march in the real world in harmony with that drum beat. And that's when you are truly discovering your passion. So let me illustrate very quickly from a very personal point, viewpoint, and you must forgive me for that, but I saw some objects here, a guitar, a tennis racket, and a football. Two of these things were I was passionate about when I was a child. I never played tennis, but I loved to play the guitar, and I wrecked two guitars. Expensive things for my childhood. You can see I wasn't very good at it. I sort of felt passionate about it for a while and then I realized it's not really giving me what I thought it would give me. I loved football. And I was reasonably good at it. But then I realized I loved cricket as much. I loved basketball as much. And I loved all of these up to a level. I enjoyed them. I was reasonably good. But they weren't sustaining me till I came to the 8th grade in school and I discovered mathematics and it happened through two mentors both of whom coincided in my 8th grade one my elder brother who showed me the beauty of Euclidean geometry until you really come to grips with a subject like Euclidean geometry you will never know what I talk about in terms of beauty and I discovered my calling in life. And I don't care whether I'm a great mathematician or a poor mathematician. It doesn't matter to me. The important thing is that I like mathematics. It drives me. It drives my inner core. That is the drumbeat to which I hark and try and march in the real world. And that is something I will remain passionate about. And I believe and I hope at the sattvic level, at the higher level, it, it sort of makes my soul resonate, maybe become purer. And I wouldn't know what my soul is. I cannot define that. But the voice, the conscience that emanates from whatever source, that source is your soul. Think of it like that. But let me get back to great and deep examples. And then I believe I will have made my point very clearly, very precisely. Mahatma Gandhi at a very early stage in his life began to resonate with the concept of truth. 
It's hard to say how he discovered it. But there is always an external stimulus, something that goes inside, it penetrates to your, the core of your being, the soul, and the soul opens up, and you begin to listen to a drumbeat within. And then when you try and start marching in harmony with that drumbeat, you begin to discover your passion. And Gandhi, at a very early age, saw the play, Satyavadi Raja Harishtan. And the adherence to truth that Harishchand displayed in spite of the great difficulties that he faced, the calamities that he faced in his life had a huge impact on Mahatma Gandhi at a very early age. He resolved to be like that, to adhere to the truth no matter what the cost. Gandhi began to do that very early in school when an inspector of schools visits his classroom. I think he's in the 8th grade, ninth grade, something like that. And asks the whole class to spell this word of the English language. And I don't even remember what the word was. Gandhi couldn't spell it. And Gandhi's teacher was afraid that the class and the teacher will get a lower grade, a lower assessment in the eyes of that inspector. So the teacher encourages Gandhi to cheat, to look into the neighbor's notebook and copy the spelling. And you know, at that age, all of us are so much in awe of our teachers. We try to please them. And when they tell us to do something, we believe it's the right thing to do because we look up to our teachers. But Gandhi refused. That adherence to truth had begun to resonate in his life. But you know, what exactly is the truth? That which you believe in and that which you then get hold of and allow it to in many ways, many ways sort of suffuse your entire body, your soul, your thought processes with that. That is going to be your passion. And so Gandhi goes on to this long journey in life. And you can see at every stage, he's trying, he's trying to be better and better, better and better with the truth. But here's an incident that happens, and that's when he really discovered the final meaning of his life. He is on this train journey from Johannesburg to Durban. And his friend Polak gives him this book, Ruskin's Unto This Last. And he tells Gandhi, you may enjoy reading this book on the journey. And Gandhi records in his own words that he opened the book to read when the journey began. And when the journey ended, he had finished about the same time reading the book. And he had discovered the meaning of his life. He said, I understood. When I disembarked from the train, I was a changed man. He saw nothing but a clear path for the rest of his life. He had discovered his passion. The rest of his life is nothing but a, the story of adhering to this passion, no matter what the cost, at the cost of his family, at the cost of his personal well-being, he adheres to the truth. All other actions of Gandhi in his life, whether it was with politics, whether it was with spiritualism, whether it was with his diet, all of them emanate from this core belief that starts with his journey to discover what the truth is and to adhere to this passion for discovering the truth and remaining consistent with that his whole life. And so he became Mahatma Gandhi because he adhered to it no matter what the price, no matter what the cost. If you look at the life of Michael Faraday, in his time, the greatest scientist of the world and one of the greatest scientists of all times, you know, he had no formal education. His mother took him out of school in the second grade. Came from a poor family. At age 14, he gets apprenticed to a bookbinder's shop. I'm reminded of Kabir who said, Jako rakhe sanya mar sake na koi. Somewhere these coincidences also happen in very meaningful ways. Since he needed to earn to be independent of his parents who didn't have money to support him. He had to be apprenticed. He could have gone to a blacksmith. He could have gone to somebody else. 
But he goes, he's taken by his father to a bookbinder. What good fortune. So this man teaches himself to read, write, he's self-taught largely, and he starts looking at all the books that come to the bookbinder. There is this curiosity, there is this external stimulus. That is necessary, otherwise people will not discover their passion. I cannot believe they will. And during the course of this business of looking with curiosity at all the books, he began to resonate with the books on science. That began to allow him to reach within and discover his inner drumbeat. And then he began to journey into the world of science and he became a scientist, the scientist, the greatest scientist of his time. A man who had no formal education. He had discovered his passion and then no matter what the cost, he adhered to it. If you think his journey was smooth, not in the least. He went to be an assistant, a lab assistant in the lab of Sir Humphrey Davy. Sir Humphrey and his wife did not treat him well since he did not come from the nobility. He didn't come from the upper classes. He was humiliated time and again. But Michael Faraday did not give up his adherence to science, to the journey of discovering things in science because that was his passion, no matter what the cost, no matter what the price. You have to adhere to that. That single-minded devotion to that which you believe in will allow you to discover your passion. Kabir says it so well. Sahib mera ek hai, dujha kaha na jaya. Dujha sahib jo kahun, sahib khada rasa. You have to pick your master, that which you believe in, that is your guiding light. And as Waldo Emerson said, then hitch your wagon to that star and follow it. It's your guiding light, it's your guiding star. It will take you through your journey in life. If you look at other people, other people's lives, if you look at the life of Srinivas Ramanujan, such a poor family could not afford proper meals. But very early in life, he comes across this book. In today's parlance, it is what we call here in Delhi a mug book, a book meant for clearing entrance examinations, competitive examinations. It is not a great book of knowledge in mathematics. It is just a collection of mathematical formulae and statements of theorems. In the most concise way, with no inspiring thoughts, nothing. But that strikes a chord inside Srinivas Ramanujan. And no matter what the, cry, what the cost, Ramanujan now adheres to mathematics. He goes through this book. Makes it his master. Sahib Mera Ek hai. And he adheres to it with such devotion that he begins to evolve. His soul, his passion comes out and he marches in the real world in complete harmony with this passion. And when I say such a thing ennobles you, it you know, makes you a nobler person. And you should never do it just to pretend and be called by the world a noble person. No, these are what I call the side benefits of adhering to your passion. Ramanujan does that. He refuses to give up mathematics no matter what the cost. All he looks for is two square meals a day. Something to support himself and his wife, but will not give up mathematics. And he becomes the greatest mathematician that India has ever produced and one of the greatest in the world in the history of mathematics. And you know, how does he become noble? All his life, Ramanujan sought two square meals a day. Essentially that. Eventually, when the world recognizes him as a genius, the British government sanctions a magnificent salary for Ramanujan. At that point in time, Ramanujan knew that he is not going to live for more than a year. He had an idea, an inkling, an intuitive feeling. He was seriously ill. His parents were poor and completely dependent on him. His wife was dependent on him. Yet this great son of India writes to the government and says this money may be put aside and given to talented and needy students. That's what I call 
being ennobled by pursuing your passion, knowing that his wife will be penniless after he is gone, yet he gives that money away. That's what I call discovering your passion. Anybody's life, you look at anybody you admire, who have done well in life, have sustained themselves through the pursuit of that which they believe in. And you will find some external stimulus, some mentor who guides them, provides a pathway, but the essential effort is theirs and they stick and adhere to that, that pursuit, no matter what the cost, as Bhagat Singh did, or as the great French mathematician Evariste Galois did, who died at the age of 21 in a pistol duel, but had pursued, in spite of other distractions, mathematics. And he solved the greatest problem of the century in mathematics when he was just 16 years of age. He knew next morning he's going to die in the pistol duel. So he sits up the whole night, not worried about the duel, not worried, knowing he will die, not trying to prepare, not trying to escape. And he writes his entire theory in a letter to his friend. Entire discovery. One of the greatest letters in the history of science. And he will be immortal because he pursued that passion. He discovered it and remained true to it. He didn't try to prepare for the duel. He wanted to make sure that mathematics is served. That's what I call discovering and serving passion. I believe I have made my point, tried as I told you at the beginning, to illustrate with examples. Maybe that's the best way to go about it. Thank you very much.